How's the song go again? Uh, tech in the morning, tech in the evening, tech at supper time. <laughs> and then we got to work it out from there. Yeah, I mean, this is just, just the beginning. It's just a start. It's yeah. a good start, though. I think it's a solid start, I think, because we do need a theme song. I felt here. inspired this morning <laughs> on the way <laughs> in. I just felt overwhelmed with uh, the tech vibes. Yes, the tech Hopping vibes. Hopping in the like truck the on the way down to that dreary day that we're uh -huh. that we're uh, you know working through today here in Portland, Oregon, and that just popped into my head for some reason. Vote now, tech in the morning. Should that be the new theme song? Hello, everyone. This is Digital Trends Live. This is our daily show here from Digital Trends, where we discuss all that is going on in tech and bring you up to date with all the leading headlines and bring you amazing interviews and songs. Uh, but right now, why do we do this? Let's run down the docket of what we've. Got got here on this Thursday. So today, uh, joining us here in just a little bit, we're going to have Jason Neubauer here on the show. Now, Jason is a social media influencer. He's an entrepreneur. I mean, he's this list and litany of things that he's done. He's the creator of the show, The Santa Claus Effect. If you've watched that on Amazon Prime, um, he's been on Shark Tank and he won Wheel of Fortune. So hasn't accomplished a lot, but maybe we'll find something to talk to him about. Uh, then we'll get to uh, Julian Chocatu, our mobile editor over in New York. And he is going to be joining us to talk about some of the trends coming up with CES because CES is right around the corner. It is on Monday. Monday, just a few days away. CES actually kind of starts before that even. So CES coming up. He's going to talk about some mobile trends and maybe what we'll see at that. But also, I have it on good authority that he just got a pair of those Focals AR glasses, the augmented reality glasses. He may or may not have a pair of those on right now. So we've got him coming up, but that's not all. We also have Jeff Barrett, who is going to be joining us here a little bit. Jeff Barrett is a writer for Inc. Uh, he recently visited 30 different cities last year talking to entrepreneurs. So we're going to talk to him just about that, about getting started in entrepreneurship, and then also some of his, uh, his predictions of where he thinks technology is going to go in 2019. Some of them are pretty interesting, so we're going to talk to him about that. We're doing all of this while broadcasting live on Periscope, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube, meaning we can take your comments and your questions as we go through the day. I'm Greg Nibbler, and starting the day off here with me is, of course, Caleb Dennison. Hello, hey, Caleb. Good morning. <clears throat> Caleb, I just want to say again, the song is excellent. I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. And we can really work something. It's a little rough that. right now, but we'll, we'll, we'll take it somewhere special. Yeah, I think, uh, I think clearly, you know, that we can get some help maybe from viewers and they can... Uh, Help yeah, let's that. crowdsource the genius around Crowds, this. Crowdsource that. that. <laughs> well, Caleb, I know you are busy getting ready for CES, and there's lots that's going on with that. Yeah, no, not at all. Not at all stressed out. Clearly not over here. No, yeah, no. Yesterday was the first, last night, I felt the first real kind of anxiety about it. And the thing is, it's not that like I'm not excited to go to CES. I right. am excited. I also, there's a little bit of dread going on there, but um, it's, I, I just, I don't want to wait. I just want to do it. I want yeah, to get the plane here. ride over with, you know, get over there, do yeah. the thing, jump into it, because once you start, you don't really have time to think about, like, yeah, you're just seeing all the, the hell that you're in. Yeah, you're, you're just go, 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 go. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of really exciting, I'm a TV guy, I review TVs here, if you don't know uh, who I am out there. I'm really excited by some of the stuff that's coming uh, down the line. And I get to go there and stand there and look at it and talk about it and learn about it, do deep dives and tech sessions and stuff like that. So it's a big part of my year. You know, it's our yeah. Super Bowl, as we say around here. Right. Um, and I want to get to it. I just don't want to wait. I want to go now. Well, it's coming up soon enough. You have to have just a little bit of patience because we still have to talk about some news and some other things. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm down to do this this morning. Well, follow all the coverage at digitaltrends.com. But let's get to some news that's happening right now. So taking a look at what What's going, what's going on? I, I, every day I kind of try to take a look at what's trending or what people are talking about. And this is one. If you have a Chromecast, you may be interested to know that thousands of Chromecasts were hacked. And uh, these were by white hat hackers. So people who were trying to do ostensibly trying to do good to showcase that things can be hacked. And uh, there are thousands of people who are reported to have this thing. It's being called the cast hack, and it was designed to expose security flaws. Now, this wasn't designed by Google. This was actually perpetuated by somebody that we've talked about here on the show before, uh, by somebody known as Hacker Giraffe. And then also, he's got a partner, and I can't pronounce it. It's J3WS3R. Looks like Jaws, like ja Jaws I think. Sure, we'll go with Jazzer. All right. Uh, so They're Hacker laughing Draft at us right now, by the and way. And oh, I'm sure Jazzer is. <laughs> uh, Hacker Draft has actually commented on some of our posts before. Uh, so this is what would show up if you were one of these Chromecasts that got hacked. So this would show up on there. It says your Chromecast smart TV is exposed to the public internet and is exposing sensitive information about you, or could. Um, then, as usual, when it comes to Hacker Draft, he adds in something about subscribing to PewDiePie on YouTube. Is that the best marketing campaign for PewDiePie ever? Wow, that's not great, actually, yeah. for them. And well, uh, 
Yeah. In addition uh, to it being uh, not being Jawser, I think it might be Juicer. I don't know. I don't uh, know. Juicer, maybe. Juicer. Let's not waste too much time on. Yeah, this. I don't think that. Yeah. The fact of the, mac, uh, the matter is that Hacker Giraffe extended the long neck of the law in the yeah. internet, and uh, and actually I think is doing a good thing here. You know, there so there was a similar story uh, last week about a person who had their. Um, their was it their Nest Cam or their Nest thermostat? Uh, yes, hacked, and then somebody started talking to them through their uh, their Nest Cam, and uh, letting them know, hey, I mean, it was kind of a creepy conversation. If you heard the audio of it, because the guy recorded it on his phone, it's kind of creepy. But the guy was just trying to let the the other person on the other end know, listen, you're vulnerable. You yeah, know? you're exposed. I got to be honest with you, though, I'm really surprised that this hasn't happened already. Like the Chromecast oh. just seems easy to hack. It's just a, such a simple little device. Yeah, and there's not a whole lot to it. Turns out if they turn off universal plug and play, which is you know what makes it really easy for devices to connect to each other, uh, apparently it also makes it really easy for hackers to get in. But if that were to be disabled, like if if uh, you know Google deploys a fix, maybe this wouldn't be such a big deal. But um, I mean, much more complicated smart TVs have already been hacked. You know. Oh yeah. You know That's the cameras in them years. have been hacked. Yeah. The microphones have been hacked. I'm surprised it took this long, but uh, you know, good on Hacker Giraffe for for trying to do something good. I know that there's a lot of people who look at this as sort of like vigilanteism. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, it's. I'd rather know than not know. You I'd know? rather, yeah, if it's just somebody putting up a stupid, you know, subscribe to a YouTube star, and by the way, you're hacked. I mean, yeah. I'd rather take that. Would you feel violated? Would you feel? Like, oh yeah. Like if you were just like watching TV and all of a sudden this message came up or it redirected It'd be to creepy, some nefarious sure. YouTube video, yeah, yeah, it's a it would bit definitely weird. be creepy. I mean, and that's what I'm. You know, this happened to thousands of people, so I'm wondering how many of these people even knew what was going on, right? Like, could understand like what just happened right there. But uh, you know, and if that if you were one of them, let us know. I'd, I'd be curious what uh, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I wonder if you would you wouldn't necessarily connect the dots and think, yeah. oh, my thing was just hacked, you know? Right. Uh, but you might like, go to oh, that link. You might go to that link, and if you do go to that link, you could be scared that that link could be a virus or yeah, you know, malware of a, some other sort. But like, if you go to the link, you'll figure it out. If not, I'm not sure you know right off the bat that you were just hacked yeah. and need to do something about that. Well, the Google actually did make a comment. They said, we received reports from, we have received reports from users who have had an unauthorized video played on their TVs and a Chromecast device. They said it's not an issue with Chromecast specifically, but it's rather a result of router settings that make oh. smart devices, including Chromecast, publicly reachable. Still though, that's something that's on Chromecast. I think it's still at that point. Yeah, well maybe that's to the point that the Chromecast is so simple, maybe that's part of the problem. No, like if yeah. your router is not secured, then your Chromecast is just wide open. But I think it does serve as a good lesson that all of our devices are potentially vulnerable, so it's good to be aware of that. Yes. So be aware. All right, uh, let's go on to our, some of our read them and weep segment here, where we'll oh, take a my look favorite. at the comments and the well, how well, various words that have come through on our different accounts. <laughs> the Some words them, and I phrases. I wouldn't even call them as comments. Uh, but we, we take a look here at what people have said because we do read the comments. And we are broadcasting live, which means if you're dropping in comments right now, I can read them. Hello to uh, Rhino. Thank you, Rhino. And Ben for tuning in right now. And uh, I'll take a look across across our different platforms, so definitely let us know. Oh, Chris just said, although uh, I think someone hacked my Netflix and watched all of the chilling adventures of Sabrina. So I'm sure it wasn't you, Chris. I'm sure we'll figure out who got to the bottom it of that It was my daughter. It was, <laughs> it was, sorry. It was Caleb's daughter hacked in and watched it there. She's 10 years old. Yeah, it's Girl's possible. Girl's a whiz. Yeah, that's true. Well, let's talk about some read them and weep, <laughs> there are read them and weep segment here. Uh, Rob Willis, regarding digital trends live, Chinese DNA hackers lose patience. Chinese DNA hackers are doctors. Oh, okay, that's I. I can see the phrasing. I, I get your phrasing right there. But it's yeah, actually, the DNA hackers are doctors. So, yeah. So I mean, actually, it does kind of work out. I mean, that's you, true. You have a PhD in anything, and you're a doctor of that thing. I don't know that. I mean, I suppose there's amateur DNA hackers. Can you? Can I you do don't. That? I, Dude, the equipment is so expensive. Yeah. Like, no, I don't think there's a whole lot of amateur it's hackers. There's not a DIY <clears throat> DNA hacker. Some crew. backyard DNA hackers, you know, <laughs> down in their mom's basement with a, you know, $10 million <laughs> CRISPR machine. Doesn't yeah. seem very likely to me. I'm doing yeah. half press. Come on, I mean, this is, this is not your ENT. The guy's not diagnosing strep here. He's a, he's a doctor. Dude, I got a CRISPR machine <laughs> in my basement. Come over, man. Come on over, man. <laughs> Check it out, Peter. <laughs> All right, well, Rob, uh, yes. So the answer is yes to answer your question. So we do we do answer the questions as they come through here on Read Them and Weep. All right, what's our next one here? Joel, oh boy, this is a long one. I haven't read it yet. I'm going to guess there's chemtrails involved, but I don't know. Joel C., regarding the future of 5G, 
5G is a proven health hazard. I've seen documentation of DNA damage, headaches, burns, and cancer appearing in lab rats. The companies investing in this deadly technology know these risks, but still do so because of their ties to the global elites plans. Okay, we got global elites to depopulate at all of our expense. That's a lot of uh, I don't a lot of initiative you're is, being. Is there Joel really joking, playing? or is he like a com a chemtrail guy who is a so hardcore I conspiracy feel like theorist? Joel C has commented here before, but I I can't remember which way he leans. Um, regardless, I don't know. I mean, he's seen the documentation, Caleb. Mm. So I mean, it's clearly that Joel said he's seen it. He's seen the papers. He's seen the papers. The secret so papers. I expect you to bring which this I up am not privy. You know, CES. I would just I would sure yeah we'll definitely invest investigate this, I kind of already did though. I would just say yeah. this, take a look at the uh, radio bands that are being used for 5G. The reclaimed spectrum that we took away from analog TV, which has been beaming around our heads for, I don't know, since the, what, the 50s, the early, late 40s, 40s or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so maybe look into that a little bit. Yeah, because that is that is. <laughs> Just saying. All right, Caleb. Not to be too cryptic. I don't want to feed into that too much. Yeah, well, there it is. Okay, well, chemtrails. All right, uh, there's Joel. Thank you, Joel, for commenting because we do read the comments and we do appreciate that was entertaining. all the comments. At the that is, least, that took that a, lot totally to, a lot of time to a lot of time to write that out. Another long one. Uh, what you read is what you get. And uh, regarding digital trends, sweep a vac turns your kitchen cabinet into a vacuum. So why is it only... Okay, I'm starting to read this. Perhaps I should read ahead before I continue. Um, why is it only high-heeled female foot models are featured in this waste of a promo spot? They couldn't find a slovenly dad foot shoving split, spilt, spilt guacamole. guacamole and coffee grinds into a hole in a cabinet. I don't even know what this article is about. Um, well, it's I mean, I mean, it's an it's another one of those centralized vacuum systems where there's a little, you know, like there's a little slit down at the bottom of your cabinetry and you just okay. sweep stuff in there and it goes, you know, I like that idea. Big old sucking whoosh sound and your your dirt is gone. OK. And I guess this person is just thinking, you know, high heeled female foot models. Uh, aren't necessarily the best way to market this product. And instead, you would want some dumpy dude, you know. <laughs> also, guacamole doesn't seem like the right substance to send through one of these systems. Yeah. You know, yeah. dirt and dust and, and, and you know, maybe, maybe potato salad. Guacamole, I don't think so. I mean, and plus five-second rule. Just get a chip and scoop that stuff There you up. go, five-second rule, yes. Yeah, anyway, but problem. yeah, uh, okay. I guess, I guess he feels <laughs> like it was unrealistic uh, promo spot. We didn't make it. No. The product true. makers did that. So, well, all right. Well, there you go. What you read is what you get uh, mm -hmm. with that comment. Uh, taking a look at a couple of our, our live comments uh, coming through here. It's just to re reference some of the things that we talked about. Sam said, maybe if someone is camped out in front of the 5G transmitter, sure, maybe it's a problem like standing in front of a microwave oven with yeah. the door open. Good point. Sam. Well, and you know what? I'll go ahead and lend some of my own personal credence to that. And that, you know, the whole idea is that there will be tons of these little stations, these little... Yeah. Uh, hot spots in various different places, you know, so it's not like the gigantic towers that they put, you know, way up high and in remote places to reach large swaths of people. Yeah. There are these little hot spots. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the effects of standing next to a transmitter like that are. Probably not great. Um, but I do hope that they will, you know, keep them far enough away from people that it's not going to do any, you know, major damage. So, yep, good point. Sam, thank you for your comment as well. All right, I'm not going to try to pronounce this one. Uh, regarding Huawei Watch GT, I admire any manufacturer that tries to develop their own OS, but why create an OS for your watch without any support for third-party apps? If that's the case, that is a very good point. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that does seem very counterproductive. Like, here's, a, here's an operating system that you can only use here, and no one else can develop it. Well, we can't even use it. It's a yeah. Huawei product, so... That's true. We can't get it here, yeah. So, yeah. I'm not going to worry about it too much. <laughs> Good point. Uh, right there. Let's continue on. I'm not sure how many more of these we have here for our Read and Weep segment, but... So many more, I hope. We've got two these. more. Two more. Uh, Mark Borland, regarding... Pot, let's see, what is that, pothole drone? Mm -hmm. Oh, in the future, potholes could be repaired by asphalt printing drones. Somebody doesn't know what a pothole is or how to fix it. I do, that's a very smug comment. I guess. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, if you somebody? don't remember, if you haven't seen this, this article, so it's, it's talking about some, you know, some future drones and where you could have a drone, which I think fixing potholes is a great use for a drone. 
but yeah, so it's okay. I can kind of see what you mean. Maybe he's little, saying that's not a pothole. That's, not, that's a tiny little. Well, listen, it's just a small example. I think it's like a demonstration. Yeah, if, if, if you could actually also fix they're on a the golf course. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> see a whole lot of potholes in the golf course. All right. Well, maybe maybe he's got a point. And in theory. This could be a pretty cool idea, though. I would like drones that are running around. Another way of making that comment would be, hey, how about showing me something at scale instead of this tiny little thing okay. and make me believe it's an actually viable yeah. pothole fixing drone. That is the editor in you correcting Mark's uh, comment. Just another perspective. <laughs> I'm not trying to be snarky. No, I think, no, I, I, I agree. You'll agree. know when You'll I'm trying to win. be snarky, dude. Oh, yeah. You'll know it. Mark, thank you for your comment. Mm. <laughs> Continuing on. We got one more comment here for a read them and weep, and then we've got time for a. Oh, to do or a, Mark Borland. To do, oh, Mark is back. Um, yet another home kitchen appliance explodes. This time, a Whirlpool fridge. Leftovers must have been the bomb. That was solid. I don't think I can add anything nope. else on that. Moving on. Okay, all right. <laughs> Although Keelan just said, dudes are salty about prototypes. Damn, you can't invent anything. That's uh, true. All Thank right. You. Let's continue talking about some news. So there was another big news story yesterday, uh, well, among many other ones, but this one having to do with uh, China. Actually, we knew this was coming, but they, they I guess, officially did it. Their Chang'e 4 spacecraft landed on the dark side of the moon, being the first human aircraft to make a soft land aircraft, or the first human craft to make a soft landing on the far side of the moon. Um, pretty big accomplishment. You know, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of, of near field space activity, I feel like. You know, the, yeah. the big headlining stuff, I mean, there's tons of stuff going there's on lots, in, in, yeah. in near field space, so I should correct myself. Well, yeah, but, it, but especially like a lot of the big news has been, you know, either Mars focused or exiting the solar system. We haven't done whatever. much with the moon lately. Yeah. You know, we haven't gone there to visit recently. And, uh, and I knew that China was uh, making a go at this, and look, they did it. Yeah. Landed a little probe on the move. Now, what are they going to get out of it? That's my question. Well, that's actually what they're talking about is some of the things that they're going to be uh, looking for. So the, the lander features a landing camera, terrain camera, low frequency spectrometer, lunar lander, neutrons, and dust symmetry. And there's, there's a whole bunch of different things that it's got on there. So it can analyze and actually... Uh, map out its near area really, really well. Um, that's a, I believe that's a rendering of what it's supposed to look like. There is an actual picture of it from, or that it took from the dark side of the moon. I hope it's outfitted uh, with, you know, really bright lights to combat all of that darkness. Well, that's the thing. It's not really dark. It's no. just, it's dark to us. Yeah, I suppose, uh, okay. Because it's on the far Shows side. Shows what I know about the moon. So You know what, I'm going to stick to TVs, y'all. <laughs> I'm going to stick Since to TVs. The moon, and... the moon is tidally locked, so like the other side of the moon, we don't see it. We always see right. the same side. But that other side, that does get some light. Yeah. So it, it does go around. Um, but part of uh, one of the things they're going to be doing is a biological experiment where they're going to be tracking how silkworms, tomatoes, and some other kind of plant grow and develop on the lunar surface. So they've, they've got some kind of setup there I don't know exactly how that's working. Again, this is their report, so okay. I don't know the specifics on this, but that they're going to at least test something along those lines. Interesting. For a biological experiment. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. So I imagine they have like a contained box maybe mm -hmm. with some seedlings in there. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. With its own little atmosphere. Something. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure exactly. So slightly less way. gravity and maybe not the same... Okay, whatever. Yeah, exactly. go for it, China. Yeah, show us well, what you got. <laughs> thanks, China. Uh, so, so that is one of the things that they're going to be uh, doing. So, it's a big, it's a big achievement. So, congratulations to them and their uh, service for coming up with that. All right. See, so I think we have time for one more news story, then we'll need to go to break here coming up because we'll be heading to New York to talk to Julian Chocatu. Or no, actually, that's coming up later on today. We'll be talking to Jason Newbauer first. Uh, but let's get to this, this other one that I want to bring up, talking about you know CES and some really groundbreaking technology that we hopefully will get to see. This isn't quite there yet, but something that in the future we may get, and it comes from Google, who just received FCC approval for their Project Soli project. Uh, project Soli project. I suppose I could come up with another word at the end. Uh, but it did get an approval. So what this is... Was essentially, the idea is to use uh, radar for phones to where the new way of thinking with this would be that you just use gesture-based controls and you never actually touch your phone or your object or your speaker, whatever it is. And uh, there's a little demonstration there. It's, they, they say, like, imagine like a virtual button that you mm -hmm. press or a virtual dial where you dial up the, um, the sound. Mm -hmm. And they can use these radar waves I guess it, they work really well for detecting this. Well, I can see how that would add some uh, 
some accuracy to a yeah. gesture control system, which has been the problem. Like we were talking about this yesterday, you know, there was gesture control for TVs like four or five years ago. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, really, really simple, like two camera based depth sensing system. It didn't work very well. Um, and they kind of abandoned it because nobody wanted to do it. Um, this is an idea that it like, it looks cool, but I'm having trouble imagining how much I would actually want to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think once we see this is like for a, phones, I really have no problem holding my phone and touching it. You know, it's it's like fixing a problem that doesn't germs, exist. Caleb, the germs. Well, there are a lot of germs, There's but a lot of you germs. know, I'm well. I'm I'm okay. I'm here. Yeah, that's true. We made it this far. Well, that's that's one of the things they got approval for. You can read all about that at Digital Trends. I know we need to wrap up here because we have a very great segment coming up for you here in just a second. Caleb, thank you. In my pleasure, my pleasure. We're going to be back a little bit later today, right? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, that's right. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be doing our CES preview, where we're going to preview everything that's going on for uh, CES. It'll feel for, like today, but it'll actually Digital be Trends tomorrow. Live. Well, all the days run together yeah. when it comes down to CES, so we're awake and we're here. I'll just imagine we're always here at this desk, whether the cameras are on or not. Um, all right, Caleb, thank you. You're coming welcome. up, we are going to be taking a quick break here right now, and then we're going to be hopping on with Jason Newbauer. So Jason Newbauer is going to be joining us to talk about his amazing career. He's done so many things. I have to ask about Wheel of Fortune. I'm sorry, I have to. Uh, but then we're going to talk about a lot more important things, too, and some of the different work that he's doing with his great uh, project, Effect Change, and the Santa Claus Effect, and kind of taking that entrepreneurial spirit and using it for, uh, for charity and, and how he's uh, utilizing that. So we're going to talk about that here, broadcasting live on Twitch, Periscope, Facebook, and YouTube, bringing you all the latest tech headlines. So let's take a quick break. Right back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live, broadcasting live on Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, and all over the internet where we can talk to you directly. So drop your comments and your questions in there as we go through the show. And we're very excited right now to be joined by the CEO and founder of Effect Change, Jason Newbauer. Hello, Jason. Hey, how you doing? Happy New Year. Doing great. Yeah, Happy New Year to you too. Um, there is so much to talk about with you that I want to get into this and talking about the Santa Claus effect and talking about effect change and everything that you've done. But I think maybe we need to like, we need to start from the beginning to just, yeah. to just fill in everybody on your incredible career and just talk about maybe entrepreneurship in general and kind of get your backstory on how you got into this when you found your love of entrepreneurship. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I always had the spirit. I mean, going back from when I was six to like finding golf balls, you know, heading back <laughs> at, a, at our lake house to, you know, in college kind of took it to the next level that we had an entertainment company and we were the middleman between the, the Greek organizations and throwing concerts. And uh, but at the end, uh, I lost thirty two thousand dollars on a Sean Kingston call on a concert that I borrowed money from my girlfriend's dad. And I was like, I'm never going to be an entrepreneur ever again. I'm like, I don't understand why I'm working so hard to make my life harder. And the plan was to go and, and 
follow my dad's path at his company and, and I work construction and I work for a large general contractor and I was driving to South Central LA every day building this Kaiser Permanente building and I was like, man, like there's just gotta be more to this, you know? But I was so grateful at the time because I got to understand how to put all the pieces together and, and, and build a building. And so fortunately enough, right before I graduated, I tried out for Wheel of Fortune. And at the same time, the project finished I had the same time for the first idea. And I won $32,000 in a 10 day cruise, the Panama Canal. And once I, I swear to God, once I met my CTO the day before I got on the cruise, that's when I knew I just wanted to get off the boat and, and just dive in, you know, and it was one of those things that if I didn't, I, I could live with the fact that I failed. You know, I was 23, as ignorant as you could possibly be, right? But right. I couldn't live with the fact that I, I couldn't try. And this was before being an entrepreneur was really cool. We were very early, like, days. You know, this is HTML5, Facebook. Everything's just going up into the boom. So, you know, it was really kind of the sink or swim. And obviously, experience is something you get right after you needed it. And I, and I lived that, you know, for, for a 10-year journey so far. <laughs> Wow. I mean, and that's such a great story. Like going from going from that, finish that job and not sure what to do. You go to Wheel of Fortune and win on Wheel of Fortune, which that is a whole conversation for another show. I want to hear all about that. Yeah. Uh, but it's Wheel of Fortune, but you win that, go on your careers. Oh yeah, there's an image too that uh, that was on your uh, Twitter account, I believe. Uh, of just you on Wheel of Fortune. Uh, that was the first suit my mom bought me for $120 from Kohl's. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get it just for going on the show? Yeah, just for going on the show. Yeah, I wasn't tailored or anything, but yeah. <laughs> that's that's awesome. So yeah. so you did that, you know, you go on Wheel of Fortune, and then you come up with this idea, and how do you go from there and end up on Shark Tank? Let's go from that segment. Well, you know, it, it, it started, so, you know, I think you start when you build something, the thing that I knew most about that I was passionate about was betting back in the early days, right? And so, you know, we had this whole idea about building a social betting network, you know, having this way that friends interact with each other but not go into to the gambling side component of it, right? And I'm very fortunate. Nils Lars, our CTO of everything that I've done, this guy is, is even more interesting than Dos Equis, man. He's the top video architect in the world, built the first digital C, uh, studio for CNN, Synergy Sports, uh, V Extreme, which became the original Windows Media Player team. So we're really focused on like the story side of the bet. But I think, you know, with anything related to companies is, you know, it's all about the timing, you know, and we were a little bit too early. and. It was great because we, we we hit it off. It works. We got the top five in sports. You got 100,000 downloads, you know, and we, we really wanted to evolve it into an actual platform. And, and it was a really interesting time because our board members started to manage these kids, Nash Greer and, and Cameron Dallas. And he, I remember I was about to go meet Dan Bolzarian going up to his house in, in, in L.A. And he called me. He's like, these kids are the future. And I was like, yeah, right, man. Good luck. And I watched them drive 1.2 million downloads to this average game. And I was like, oh, my God, this is going to change the whole way marketing and distribution is going to work. And I said, Nils, these kids are already making challenges on YouTube. Why don't we have a way that these kids can respond? And in the middle of that, that's when the ice bucket challenge happened, right? So, so I shifted the business knowing that I could spend all the money in the bank that what we have on Facebook ads and not even get close to where we we're going to go on challenge. And so that ended up taking up the rocket ship, right? Yeah. But this is at the same time where Chris Stoikos, uh, was one of my best friends, he had we had the idea for Coolbox. You know, they were doing some marketing, and I was like, well, what if there was a smart toolbox? And he also had Dollar Beard Club at the same time. So we had these three things in the middle. And so, you know, and, and the cool box was great because we wanted, I wanted to build a tangible product, right? You know, so much of what we did was software. I love Shark Tank. You know, we, he was amazing at viral marketing. And we saw what the coolest cooler did. So, you know, we put it out on Indiegogo. You know, we got into like, it was like 450,000, you know, we had in pre-orders, which is great. All fine and dandy, right? You know, and then start going in the tooling, totally understand that we underestimate how much the tooling is going to cost. Right. And then, you know, fortunately enough, we get selected for Shark Tank. And so then that's that's how we got to go on Shark Tank. Um, and then you want me to kind of go through that or what that was like? Or? Well, no, I mean, that's I mean, I think that's amazing right there. Just getting onto yeah. Shark Tank and just kind of getting the idea of that entrepreneurial spirit that you have throughout this to be able to see something, see a different way of marketing something and see, you know, have that, I guess the wherewithal to take that and apply it to what you're already doing and try to combine those different aspects. Yeah. I, I think what's great or what, what I hope that everybody can relate to is like, 
look, I, I'm, I'm a public school kid from Michigan to Cal Poly to just like, I'm not smarter than you. I, I will just outwill you and grit it. You know, like to me, I don't, I look at like failure as like a different step that allows truth. And then you get to the point where you're getting this, this whole efficient path. And I think what really like changed it on Shark Tank that wasn't actually there was, you know, I told Cuban my story, you know, I star wheel of fortune, went back, you know, to build these things to come there. And then he actually had a company with Nils, you know, my CTO, and then it became really friendly where he actually helped us negotiate of just having a credit line to go do the deal. And, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, Chris and I were both focused on the other businesses, but we had this obligation to fulfill all these Indiegogo orders where you were seeing so many of these people go out there, raise the money and not fulfill it. And I know I give a lot of credit to Chris and Alex that, you know, went out there, delivered the orders of all the units that we shipped. There was only eight that were bad. We ended up selling the company off to Kevin Harrington and, and now they're running on the day to day. So whether I ever see a dollar from that, it was it was a huge checkbox to be able to go defend everything that we know in front of those people. And I think what I would like to tell other entrepreneurs is like, look, you just got to try. Right. When you try you get that experience. Like why I can sit down with anybody in the world on the table is because nobody can take away what you live, right? So the more that you're out there trying, the more that you're doing, the more data, the more truth that you know, that can lead to the straight path forward. You know, and I think that's what everyone should, you know, try to embody. I think that's great advice for anyone, no matter what, no matter what field you're in. That's that's great advice. Well, let's talk about how you took this, you know, your your entrepreneurial spirit and working in all these businesses and now taking it more towards a, a charity side and trying to help out uh, not, you know, in a nonprofit way um, with effect change and the Santa Claus effect. Like what made you get into that? Yeah. So that's a combination of everything in life blowing up in my face, moving to Miami, wife being pregnant and, and a lot of things in, in between states. Right. And, and it really broke me down to a, a deep, hardcore depression. Like but it, it broke my spirit for the first time in, in my life. But now looking back, it's one of the things I'm most grateful for because I understand that we're always receiving blessings no matter what, whether it's good or bad. It's just things in life show you to show that getting ripped back down to your core. And I'll never forget the night that I was I was on my computer and, you know, there was interest for a book deal and I was consulting for Sprint and my son was there and, and I just didn't really, I just had nothing left. And I found this Joe Rogan quote in this video and it said, greatness is defined at rock bottom. And you could drown in self-pity or you could be here the hero of your own story. And I just said, fuck it. Like, I'm going to take it. And I had so much background with influencers and understanding it. And I'm watching all the messages that are going out with this Gen Z. And just this wasn't the type of world that I wanted my son to grow up in. And, and I always had the drive and that I always wanted to teach and help people. And and I saw that side a little bit with challenge. But, but I never got to fully embody that what it was. And so I took everything I knew about it, you know, Alan J. West, the guy I created the show with, we went out there and, and put it, and it was, it was the most vulnerable thing I ever did launching the trailer and putting it out there. But when it just, it just blew up, it worked because it was real, you know, it came from the heart and where Johnny and Sasha are now, are, they're doing incredible. You know, it was one of those things, but me giving Johnny that car and this wasn't ever on video is the thing that like changed me was his son, roll down the window and he was just like, thank you for helping me and my daddy. And it like broke me and like that, like wow. hit it where that's going to be any personal accomplishment that I can ever have. But more importantly, it's the combination of like, look, we just all need helping hands at different levels and aspects of life. Right. And that's just mm -hmm. what it, and we're not all going to have a hundred percent of energy every single day. Right. And we're not taught that we can all win together. It's so much there has to be a winner and a loser in that. And that's why Effect Change is creating a win-win world together. Because I didn't realize in business in the beginning, you have to define what type of person you want to be and how you want to operate. And that becomes incredibly difficult related around money or selling. You know, And I've made every mistake you can relate along that path. And so, so that's where it is. And so the show is really about creating the spirit and helping each other's dreams so we all embody the aspect that we have time, money, and knowledge, right? And then from there, all the products that we have are the effect of it. So in terms of our platform, our, our membrane filter, and, and so on. I think that's such a, a wonderful way to look at it. You know, I mean, because you're right, nobody can make it all on their own and we all need help sometimes and whatever that level is. And yeah. you're taking your experience and applying that to help out some people who, who need it, you know, and, and getting to see them change their lives through this. And the Santa Claus effect, where's, where can people watch this? I just want to make sure. I know yeah, Amazon yeah, Prime. 
Yeah, so you can watch the first episode on, on Amazon right now. So we're just about to start filming the rest of the first season in the U.S. and for a U.K. one, too. So the goal is we're going to come out quarter three of this year. I can't tell you what network it's going to be yet, but we're we're going. And there's some really big names and, and stuff around it, which is really, really exciting. That's know? It's so exciting. Um, what's the best place for people to follow everything that you're doing with with FX Change and you know the show and, and everything else that you're involved in? Yeah, yeah. Follow, follow them on Facebook. You know, on there you can check out you know FXChange.com. You know, you can go in there and see everything around that. You know, I'm I'm, I'm really a passion about you know this membrane filter stuff that we acquired. It's it's really we have this filter and the scientists that can actually you know take anything without power and take contaminated water and make it drinkable. So they just moved in their factory six months ago or six months away from actually making it. That stuff's included in the show, which is great. But, you know, m more importantly, it's like, I'm also excited about the platform because Challenge actually ended up evolving into effect change platform, which is amazing because it's going to be the place where the world's going to be connected and we can all affect, affect change with each other. So it, it's really cool to see how things come full circle and, and, and what they're intended for. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us, you know, and just share your story of how you got to where you are and now, you know, using this and, and inspiring others to help out other people uh, with everything that you're doing. Like, it's, it's really, really inspiring stuff. And I want yeah. to say thanks. Oh, no, no. Thank you so much, man. I just think that, you know, everybody's going through something out there and you never know the smallest thing, like all acts of kindness are the same, you know, but like, you know, we're living at the most incredible time in the world where we should be the most connected and feel disconnected. So like, why don't we just empower each other and have some fun with it? That's a wonderful philosophy. That's a great way to look at it. And, and you're uh, making a difference in that. Jason, thanks for hopping on Digital, uh, Digital Trends Live. Yes. Thanks so much. Happy New Year. Thanks. Same to you. Bye bye. All right, this is the fun thing about Digital Trends Live is we get to have interviews like that and find out different perspectives and where other people come from. And so Effect Change, that is Jason's company and uh, working to help other people. So coming up, we've got lots more though for Digital Trends Live. So we need to take a quick break and then we're gonna be hopping on with Julian Trocatu in our New York office to talk about mobile technology at CES. What can we look for? And then we'll also be maybe taking a look at his Focals AR glasses that I believe that he has. So uh, let's see, I think we're ready to go to a quick break. So let's do this. We'll take a break. We'll come back with Julian. Later on in the show, we've got Jeff Barrett as well that's going to join us. So stick right here, broadcasting live on Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. Thanks everybody for joining us. Of course, you can always drop in your comments, your questions, whether we're live or afterward. We always like to read what you have to say and we'll respond as well. And with the Consumer Electronics Show coming up just around the corner, I mean, it's almost here. It's time to talk about what we're gonna see there. And we have our one of our leading experts on mobile technology. It is Julian Trocatu out in New York. Hello, Julian. Hey, how are you? Doing well. I have to say uh, the glasses that you have on there look pretty slick. They are much bigger than I thought they were, uh, so, but, but I feel like they still uh, look 
pretty normal. I, I just rode the subway and uh, no one gave me strange looks that I feel like if I wore something like Google Glass, they would have. Right. So, <laughs> you don't have the giant, you know, camera on the side that just screams creep. You know, you don't have right. that going. So yeah, <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk about the focals here in just a minute. Before we get to those, though, uh, let's talk about CES for when it comes down to mobile. Like what are the key things that people should be expecting or what are you looking for? What are, are going to be like the key headlines for this CES? So to be honest, not much. Uh, <laughs> yes, is like a month ahead of MWC, which is obviously the show where everyone announces all their new phones and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so there really isn't too much, but it is a place for us to sort of look ahead at what we can expect. And I think there's just going to be a little more information given out about um, foldable phones, uh, for example, uh, 5G. Everyone's still going to be talking about that. Mm -hmm. and those, and then the the new sort of display that you're going to start seeing on phones, which is the punch hole display, is what it's now being called. So we had last year the whole you know two years in a row we had the whole notch display. Uh, now it's all about the punch hole display, which is basically trying to minimize that notch that's on the top of your iPhone 10, for example, and just making it into a little tiny uh, punch hole almost, uh, as as you would in a piece of paper, uh, where ju just the camera sits and the whole display rests around that. And we've already seen that uh, with a phone called the Honor View 20, which is currently sold in China. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're going to hear just more about that. People are going to share more uh, products that show off that sort of screen. And that's going to be something we're definitely going to see more uh, phones with that punch hole type display yeah. later on. The punch hole is interesting. We've, we've got some articles at Digital Trends about that. Like just to clarify, like a punch hole, you know, imagine you had a nicer phone than mine where it's the full screen. And then it's just like the, the camera hole is just like punched into the middle of the right. screen, which it's like floating in between the display. So, you know, it's going to be a full screen. Then that's the yeah. whole point. It's trying to give you as much screen real estate as possible. Uh, and then you're just basically going to have that single little punch hole camera. Now, I don't think all phones are going to have this. Uh, it's going to be uh, difficult to do this for some phones that need 3D sensing sensors at the top, for example. For example, if uh, Samsung wanted to show off an iris scanner like they do with their Note 9 phones, I don't know if they'd be able to do that with just a punch hole. So I think with phones that just have a yeah. selfie camera at the front, uh, that that's going to be what you're seeing this mostly for. And, and the notch isn't going to go away. It's still going to be there. So a lot of phones are still going to have the notch. But this is just a different type of display to sort of further expand your screen real estate for give you that futuristic feel. So that's that's something we'll see. And then you did mention, yeah, the foldable phone aspect. I mean, that's kind of been right. leading up has been a big story. I don't know whether it's, you know, more of the I don't want to say gimmicky aspect, but it, it does seem like everybody has to get some kind of a foldable phone out there right now, or a lot of people are trying. Um, how right. much are we going to see of those? I don't think Samsung or LG, who are the two people rumored to have sh originally uh, shown these devices off at CES, I don't think either of them are actually going to show this. Really? At CES. I think they will. I think at least Samsung will talk a little bit about it. Uh, I don't know if that means they'll share any more details that we already know. But uh, we're just probably going to see it. I think the latest rumor was that we're going to see the actual devices towards MWC or something okay. here. So <laughs> I, I think CES is going to be something where we get to maybe talk to these companies, maybe learn more about why they want to create these foldable phones, what the use cases are, things like that. But uh, I don't exactly know if we're going to see anything yet. Um, and uh, also, I do know we're going to have uh, this company called Royal Flex. Uh, FlexBuy is the foldable phone that they have. They're kind of a new company uh, out of nowhere. And we sort of took a look at their foldable phone earlier last year, or sorry, later last year. And, and we're going to have them at our CES booth uh, showing off their foldable phone. So we will have one. It's just from a company that no one has really heard of before. So uh, that's about it in terms of uh, devices that we'll see in terms of foldable phones. Well, there's one at least. Yeah, if you're watching the Digital Trends CES live broadcast, which you should be, if you're watching this, tune in all next week because we'll have uh, lots of interviews and products coming. So there's a there's a tease ahead. We will have the uh, Royal on there with their FlexBuy. So we've got that. And 5G is a huge discussion, you know, of where 5G is going. I feel like that's a little bit more of a Definitely a little further out as much as everybody's talking about, yeah, people are coming out with 5G phones. You need 5G networks to really utilize that aspect of it. Um, but I'm sure we'll see a lot of 5G discussion throughout. I think, I think we'll see well. more, again, like more on the discussion side. Uh, yeah. I don't think anyone's going to come out with a 5G phone, but I do think all the carriers are going to be there and they're going to all talk 5G. And we're just going to hear more improvements, more expansion, things like that. 
uh, and and hopefully soon after. I mean, for sure this year we're going to see 5G capable devices. It's just uh, where exactly will you be able to get 5G is the big question. So, well, there's uh, so that's a little bit of a tease ahead for mobile, and you've got a great article up at digitaltrends.com about that as well, and it kind of uh, walking through what's going to be going on. Let's talk really quick about the focals that you're wearing here. So in case you don't know, these are from I believe it's a company called North. Is that right? Yes. So they used to be called Thomic Labs, and now they're called North. Uh, basically, before they had this similar sort of device where it could use your uh, use your hand to gesture, navigate uh, interfaces like your computer screen or AR glasses or something like that. Uh, but now this is sort of a new direction that they're going in. So what I'm currently wearing is this is the Focals glasses, and this little ring over here is the secondary part of it. So you know they kind of work. Well, I think initially, from my first impressions, I've only worn it for about an hour uh, because they are probably the most realistic or like normal looking glasses, I would say, uh, that I've ever seen with this sort of technology. And what's basically happening is there's a little projector on this side that's shooting information to the screen, uh, to the glass. So uh, like you're seeing in the interface, that's what it looks like. So I can see the normal world and I can use this little ring. This kind of acts like a joystick to navigate through the interface. So right now, for example, a, a notification just popped up. I got an email, and I can either dismiss it so it sort of clears away, and uh, I can scroll through my emails, notifications, whatever have that I have on my phone. And I can also send texts, and Alexa is also built in, so I can ask Alexa any question, and uh, also find navigation. So I basically, uh, as soon as I got out of the subway, I navigated to the office, even though I need, didn't need the directions, but I just wanted to see how it works. Yeah. Like, uh, but so yeah, it basically gives you a, a certain select number of features that you can do, and uh, I, I mean, so far it's pretty impressive. It's, this is sort of like what you originally envisioned Google Glass to be, uh, just sort of normal-ish pair of glasses that uh, work. And, and they're supposed to get about a full day of battery life, and then it comes with a little charging case. You can put them away, and they'll also additionally charge for three extra days. So uh, pretty nifty so far. Again, I haven't gotten. I think the biggest you know, issue was, you know, will I look like an idiot? <laughs> yeah. I feel like I don't really look like an idiot. I mean, again, no one has specifically said anything yet, but uh, <laughs> perhaps people are just thinking in their minds, wow, that guy is wearing ridiculous glasses. <laughs> what a weirdo. But, yeah. So the, the one complaint I did get is that from the sides, it looks really thick. And I feel like that's, uh, you know, that's probably one hurdle that they'll have to figure out over time, maybe if, in a future device. But yeah. so far, uh, I've gotten zero feedback <laughs> well i mean i guess that's a good thing you know yeah, uh, yeah you said it's alexa enabled does it have a speaker on it yeah so uh even when i'm walking around with navigations it sort of sort of silently talks to me it's it's enough for someone who's like pretty close to me to be able to hear what they say uh or alexa says but uh if you're sort of maybe a couple feet away you probably wouldn't hear me and i can also turn off the sound if i don't want to it to make sounds or anything like that wow cool well, all right. Well, Julian, thank you so much for taking some time to, you know, to talk about this mobile technology. You're obviously going to be at CES covering yep. everything that's going on, and you can follow along at digitaltrends.com. And uh, what's the best? What's your Twitter handle? Let's get that out there too, so people can follow you. It's just my full name. It's Julian Chikatu. So at Julian. Yeah. At Julian Chikatu. So follow Julian uh, on Twitter and follow Digital Trends on Twitter and keep up to date with everything going on. And I will want to see the focals when we get to uh, Vegas. Yeah, for sure. Sweet. All right, Julian, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I'll see you there. See ya. All right, so much exciting stuff to talk about here with Digital Trends and CES coming up. And we have more still in Digital Trends Live. Uh, we're going to be talking to Jeff Barrett, who's going to be joining us here in just a few to talk about just uh, another thing about you know startups, talking about starting up companies. But then also, he's got some interesting ideas on where he thinks technology is going to go in 2019. Some, some of his predictions that I, I took a look at that I think we have to get into those and talk about those as well. So all that while broadcasting live on Facebook, Periscope, Twitch, and YouTube across all kinds kinds of platforms. We take your comments whenever they come in. So drop those in there and I will talk back to you. Well, talk back to you. Maybe I'll just talk to you. Uh, and, and all that's coming up right here. So stick right with us. We'll take a quick break right back in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. <laughs>
Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. Thanks for joining us, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, every weekday, bringing you tech headlines, news, and interviews. And we're so excited to be joined right now by, I guess, a bit of a Digital Trends alum, but also he's done some other things since then. It's Jeff Barrett. Hello, Jeff. <laughs> hey, how you doing? It's good to be on. Doing good. So you actually wrote for Digital Trends for a few articles at least. I have, yeah, and I got to write some funny ones, and I think I got to talk about Pokemon Go when it was still a thing, so. <laughs> so, all the big stories, you got them all right there. Absolutely, that's all you need. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for having me out here today. I mean, you have such an accomplished career, um, obviously, already, <laughs> but also, you know, writing for Inc., and I really want to get into a couple of different things here today. One, I want to talk about your predictions for the future, for, because I, I saw some of your predictions on where you think technology is going to go. But before yeah. we get to that, why don't we talk about this entrepreneurship side, this this way that you have gone out to, I think it was 30 some 30 cities that you've gone out to for Inc. Yeah. Uh, over this last yeah. year, talking to entrepreneurs. Like, let's Let's discuss that. What do you do when you go out to these cities and who do you talk to? Yeah, the genesis kind of happened um, toward the end of 2017. I went to Pittsburgh. Um, I went to Carnegie Mellon and started talking about kind of entrepreneur and startup cultures. And then, you know, there's Steve Case has his Rise of the Rest tour. There's other people doing the same thing. But I thought I wanted to kind of dig into what would happen if you went to a city for two or three days, met some people, figured out how you could network it. And the interesting thing is, yeah, I wrote pieces about a lot of these cities individually. But the big takeaway you get is that there actually is kind of a formula that you can use in a lot of these cities to achieve um, entrepreneurial success and kind of kickstart um, other places. Like take, for example, a city like Cincinnati, who does a good job of combining like Procter & Gamble, Fifth Third, Kroger, some of their bigger companies with entrepreneurs. So you're automatically kind of making sure that those, um, you know, those entrepreneurs and those individuals are successful because they've got big companies behind them. Um, those kind of processes that you see in place um, rather than, you know, obviously everybody's got a good craft brewery, everybody's got a good co-working space, but then getting down to the nuts and bolts, it was kind of an interesting experience. And also, I'm really looking forward to not flying as much this year. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that's, that's a lot of travel. Yeah, 30 different Every cities. Week. But yeah, yeah that's, that's really interesting, figuring out what those common threads are like for, for that exist in, you know, startup ecosystems as far as what people could be like, okay, here is a little bit of a formula. Could you give us maybe like one or two things from that formula? Yeah, and I think every place is probably about 70% similar, right? We're all kind of doing the same things. Just like if you watch like HGTV, everybody's kind of using a farmhouse sink and chip lap, right? Mm -hmm. But what, what is different about it is some places do a better job than others, but every place seems to kind of have its own expertise. And one of the biggest things I've been kind of realizing is it comes down to transportation. And that's probably the digital trend and the thread amongst all of it, right? Is that the company or the cities that get transportation the most and understand that you could start taking your employees from work and to work and their workday starts in that carpool, right? Or that ride share. Um, understanding that how we get people from place A to place B, how we, you know, figure out how to keep people in our downtown and actually stay in their downtown. It's funny how there'll be smaller cities that have really vibrant downtowns or maybe in Atlanta it doesn't have one, even though it's bigger, um, but it has other assets. The biggest Thing I think I've learned is that you have to play into your existing assets. Um, so that might be legacy companies, um, things that you're known about for a city. But then the other thing is really finding investment capital is huge. And there's two ways you can go about doing that. You can obviously have other existing companies that can help kind of springboard that. But if you don't have that, then it's kind of proving to investors that you've got some kind of expertise class in a certain area. And once you can do that, that's where it seems to that's where it seems to kick start and start going. It's it's a process where you can start an ecosystem in two or three years unless you're going into biopharma, which will take you twelve. Okay. All right. So, so there is a little bit of a way that, yeah, you can kind of yeah. figure that out. I, th I think that's really fascinating. That's something you can figure out if you do it to 30 cities in, uh, in a year, yeah. if you travel that much. Well, um, yeah, thank you. So the other thing I wanted to bring up, too, is, like I said, some of your predictions, you know, since you're out there seeing so many different workplaces, seeing technology being utilized, mm -hmm. you have some some ideas of where you think technology is going to go in 2019. And since we're coming up with CES, it's the brand new year. Maybe we could walk through a couple of what you, a couple of things that you think are going to happen. 
Yeah, I mean, there's some, some interesting things, right? So we always focus on CES, it's product-based, right? And this is obviously, it's a consumer electronics show. Where I think will be interesting in, in tech trends is you start to see it with low-frequency ID tagging. Um, low-frequency ID tagging, meaning that you can use sound waves to transfer data. There's a, a company called Listener uh, who does a really good job with this. But what would be interesting is 2019 is going to be a heavy campaign year. Uh, one of the things I think can be done is by utilizing that technology, which is kind of like automatic Bluetooth that you don't have to sign into, you could trigger donations to political campaigns or kind of spur the moment types of transfer of funds or other things using that technology. Now it's kind of loosely based on what Amazon Go does. Um, I think you'll see Amazon Go is just a test pilot, just like Google Fiber or other things where Amazon doesn't really want to be in the business of doing a ton of small grocery stores. What they want to do is they want their technology to be powering all of the existing grocery stores. What I think we're starting to get to is we're getting into a space where um, that kind of convenience um, will create something interesting for consumers, where consumers um, really latched on to delivery in 2018. Mm -hmm. Now they're starting to make that, that thought process in their head that says, well, delivery is cool, but there's always a service fee. And if I, so now you might see it trend back to people actually wanting to go to a physical store if that becomes a little cheaper, a little bit more convenient. I'm personally somebody who spent $20 ordering Krispy Kreme. So at some point you have to kind of like make a reassess, but that'll kick back. But I think the most interesting trend might be in how we save physical retail um, by utilizing digital, meaning uh, are we kicking stuff through VR? Are we doing stuff with low frequency ID where we can trigger things? Um, one of the biggest hindrances to getting um, technology to help with the retail experience, and it needs to be an experience. We've gone from having big box stores with fluorescent lighting that we just all hate, or like going to a Hollister that I used to work to in high school that just was like, I was like told, hey, yeah, just don't talk to anybody. That's <laughs> don't do that. Don't right? make eye so, contact. <laughs> yeah, don't make eye contact. To now, let's have smaller footprints. Let's be more intimate. Let's have, um, you know, there are reason for people to go into a store because, hey, you got questions. It's kind of like, you know, am I going to just go buy hardware on the internet? No, I have to go into a Lowe's and ask somebody. But where we're getting at with that experience is we've always had something where you have to opt into an app. You have to opt into this, you have to opt into that. But in an ideal world, it should just kind of trigger if you've opted into certain things, uh, allowing for that to automatically happen. So you pass a certain store, it's like, hey, Jeff, there's the size 33, 32 pair of jeans. It's now 1999. The same kind of stuff that you would encounter on the internet, which has made it so, you know, so preferable can be done in the physical space, but you can also get it immediately and have your questions answered. And I'm not saying that we should all invest heavily in malls. Definitely not. But I think you can start saving the boutique experience retail. I think that's an interesting way to look at it too, because you know that is one of the things we've thought about, with, especially with marketing and with these devices, new ways that people are gonna figure out to market. And yeah, if you open up your phone for that and then have that as a, as a possibility where you'll be like, hey, it's on sale right in there, stop in. Right. Yeah. And it's all about it's all about reducing that barrier, right? We, we've used beacons in the past. We've used things to kind of trigger, um, you know, the early, early adoption of stuff might have been, you know, those kind of gamification ways. People aren't necessarily trying to go out and play some kind of gamification when it comes to shopping or going out and getting things. They're more so it's more so. Uh, recreating the experience you have on Instagram, meaning that you just find something while you're perusing and go, oh, that makes sense. And now I just bought a poster. <laughs> you know? And that's, that's what you have to recreate because Instagram has done a great job of finding you in the moment, uh, understanding you as a customer and saying, hey, this random thing, Jeff, you're probably going to want to buy it. Yep. And they give you every time. And helping create that experience for you, that personal experience that you have. Well, Jeff, thanks for thanks for having on today too. You know, and, oh, and some by Digital Trends Live. I mean, this is great. Where where can people follow you in all of your writing and all of your different things that you're doing? Yeah, you can find me on Inc. Um, it's just Jeff Barrett. You can also find me on any social. It's at Barrett All. So, Fantastic. I'll respond to. <laughs> and type in Jeff Barrett Digital Trends. You can find his articles on there too. What's from the Sounds past? Great. Read about Pokemon. All right, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, That's great.
Jeff Barrett here on Digital Trends Live. All right, and thank you everyone today for tuning into this show. So we do broadcast every day, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. Uh, tomorrow on Digital Trends Live, we're gonna have a, a very special show where we're just gonna kind of research a little bit more about CES, give you a bit of a preview as we go into this next week. And I wanna remind everybody again that next week we'll be broadcasting live starting on Tuesday. We need Monday to get set up. Tuesday, when the show opens, we'll be broadcasting live, I believe it's 10 a.m. Pacific, we start that day. Throughout the rest of the week, we'll have eight to nine hours straight broadcasts here, uh, same kind of format as this. So the same thing that you're used to, Broadcasting Live, where we can talk to you, get your, your questions, your comments, guests coming through constantly, different companies showcasing products, different discussions. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We've got a giant staff that's going down there to cover everything that's going on on CES, so follow Digital Trends. Hit subscribe, wherever you're watching us right now, hit that subscribe button to make sure you get notified when we go live. Um, lots more to come this week. So stay tuned as always just to recap a little bit on the show today we had Caleb Dennison here in the beginning of the show uh, we had Jason Neubauer talking about the Santa Claus effect and effects change and his experiences Julian Chikatu talking about mobile tech at CES and showcasing a little bit of those Focals AR glasses and then Jeff Barrett uh, giving his predictions on where he thinks some different things are going to be going in the future all of that while we bring you this live coverage I'm Greg Nibbler thanks for joining us and we'll be back tomorrow with more Digital Trends Live